Yoan Mi Park is a very courageous human rights activist. Her story of her escape from North Korea to America via China and South Korea is nothing short of amazing and deeply harrowing. She's experienced the worst totalitarian system that you could ever imagine. Props, it would have to be the worst in the world today, I think, as well as violence at the hands of individuals while she fell into human trafficking, slavery in China. Yuan Mia has uh, written graphically and movingly about all of this in her autobiography, In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom. Last year, she graduated from the Ivy League Columbian, uh, Columbia University in New, New York City, and that's not covered in the book, but we will ask her something of her impressions about that time. So um, I think from this conversation, I hope we can cover some really important areas, insights into the nature of Marxism, of North Korea, indeed of Chinese society, but also the West and some of the dangers confronting us when perhaps we've just been too comfortable for too long. Our cherished freedoms are not as secure as we might like to think. So, Yuan Mi, can I ask you at the beginning, why did you write this quite remarkable book? Because there must have been a part of you that thought this will be dangerous, it'll be hurtful, let's just forget about it. You've obviously had a higher purpose in mind. Why did you write it? Yeah, thank you for having me, first of all, and I'm, I'm so honored to have this conversation with you. Uh, when I was writing that book, that was actually right after when Sony Studio got hacked for making the movie called The Interview. I don't know if you remember, they made a satire movie about killing assassin Kim Jong-un, and North Korea revenged them by hacking the Sony Studio. So they really tried everything they could to stop people publishing anything bad about the regime. And of course, when it came to my time, like you said, I really thought the penguin was threatened by North Korean regime directly. They threatened to blow up penguin as well. <laughs> so my, my publisher, I really thought I couldn't write the book. They, because I, I spoke out right before my writing the book, actually three generations of my family got punished who I left back in North Korea. And the reason why I, I had to do it is that when I came out to the rest of the world, I couldn't believe that most of people did not know about what was happening to North Korean people. All they knew was the funny haircut that Kim Jong-un has. You know, like how ridiculous that North Korean people cry when the leader dies. Human North Koreans are so dehumanized by media Nobody had any clue what was happening to my people, what I went through. So I, I wanted to let the world know what was happening to 25 millions of human lives in the darkest place on earth right now. Well, it's a remarkably easy read. Uh, and for all of that, incredibly harrowing and informative. Let's drill into some of the things that are really startling. Now, I'm a farmer and I've always been involved in farm policy. Uh, before I ask this question, uh, it may stagger people to realise that for the last 10 years, just as an example, the world's farmers have produced enough food for 10 billion people to eat enough protein and carbohydrates every year to reach their full potential. So for 10 years, we've produced vastly more food than we need, and that shows no real sign of ending. And yet you describe growing up in a society where you could think of nothing else but food and where um, people's physical stature was limited. Uh, people are considerably shorter in North Korea on average than they are in South Korea, which of course is a free democratic society. Uh, and you literally describe having to go and chase grasshoppers to just get something to eat. You were never able to escape the gnawing hunger. That is such a good point that you just said. It's like um, right now, like North Korea was designed like the Hunger Games. I don't know if you have read the book. There is like 13 districts and there's a capital. People in capital are really well fed and they ha they need everything they need. And the people in the other, other districts, they are on purpose being starved. 
And the reason why the regime maintaining and keeping us starving is imagine like if you are fed, right? You're still gonna think about the meaning of life. You're gonna think about art and freedom and what is the purpose of life. We're gonna engage with these higher thoughts. So the by the fact that they're keeping us starving is they are making us busy only thinking about survivor. All people have to force to do is uh, thinking about, can I find the next meal? So that is why the people in North Korea are starving, not because the country is poor. Like, look at Kim Jong-un. He's been building this like, ICBM, the new mi- missiles and the nuclear weapons so many years. And he's on purpose not feeding us so he can control us and make sure that we don't rise and fighting for freedom. Yeah, that's, it's almost impossible to believe. And so authoritarian is the regime that particularly in your time, so tight was the control over you learning what was happening in the rest of the world, that even if you had a radio or a television, it was stuck on one station that came on in the mornings, you couldn't interfere with it. If you did interfere with it to try and get more channels, uh, you, could, you, you could face severe punishment. So you didn't know what you were really being subjected to. So that is the thing, like that's what's unique about North Koreans is that, uh, so when I was North Korea, I only knew few countries in the world. I knew Americans, Japanese, South Koreans, China. I actually never knew what Australia was. In my entire life, I didn't even know different continents. North Korea is like the, I was saying like it's a different planet. They literally tell us that we are Kim Il Sung, the first leader's race. They don't even tell us that we are Asians. They tell us that we are Kim Il Sung race. And North Korean calendar does not begin when Jesus Christ was born. It begins when Kim Il Sung was born. The history was forgotten to North Koreans. We never hear anything before the Kim's time. And it, this is the only country right now till 21st century. They do not have 24 hours electricity. They do not have internet. They do not even know the existence of internet. So therefore, when I was in North Korea, I did not know that I was oppressed. I did not know that I was enslaved by the regime. And that is the difference, that dif- different kind of degree of oppression that we are talking about. These people have no clue like, I, when I heard this term, animals rights, when I escaped to South Korea, I was like, other child, like, what do you mean animals have rights? Like, as a human being, I didn't even not know I had rights in North Korea. And this is why it's so hard to explain to people what North Korea is, because it's a completely different planet. See, people think communism is all about everyone being equal. Uh, and, and I think you read Animal Farm. I- I read Animal Farm. I'm not quite sure that it's still on the reading lists in many Western schools. It ought to be. It's an incredible piece of literature, which clearly demonstrates what happens in communist regimes, that far from being flat and everybody being equal. You had a situation where you lived in a country where you were literally starving. The health care was appalling. You were freezing during the winters. Your descriptions of these things in the book are, uh, are really quite extraordinary. And yet... Um, the powers that be in that country live in unbelievable luxury and have devoted enough money to maintain, for example, as I understand it, 100,000 SAS equivalent level soldiers. In other words, an absolute elite who by definition are well looked after and well fed and have diverted enough resources to make North Korea a military threat, a nuclear military threat. So you've got this unbelievable unfairness and it's it reminds you of the for those who remember it the animal story um for you know george orwell's all animals are equal but some are more equal than others yeah exactly that i mean when the kims came in with the stalin and the Lenin support and mao support they came in they promised to north korean people that the government is going to take care of everything health care education Literally every single thing, the government is going to take care of it. We are going to be the mother party for you. And they also promised that we are going to be equal from now on. And what happened is that we don't dream of equality. What North ended up happening to North Korea is that we ended up with 50, zero, like five, zero different classes within the North Korean system. So they divide people into big three categories. 
And then within big three categories, they divide into 50 different classes and it became the most unequal society you can find on human history. And this is what that dream of equality does. It, it can never guarantee the actual true equality, it doesn't exist. And what also the regime did, like you said, right? They spend billions of billions of dollars to build these nukes and training these military soldiers. So the, the God, North Korean God, the Kims can maintain their power. Every human being, everything is dedicated to keeping one guy happy. And the, him, the cost of him being a god in the 21st century, that everybody suffers in that system. So it's extraordinary. You actually formalized, North Korea formalizes, I think you say in the book, three essential different uh, societal groups, and then another yeah. further breaking down at sort of 50 groups across those yeah. of different yeah. status. And a couple of horrendous issues arise because, funnily enough, we're starting to fall into this very trap of genetic and collective guilt in the West, whereby you could have people several generations back in your family who'd done the wrong thing and you were held to be guilty and worthy of punishment because of what, not what you'd done, not what your parents had done, even your grandparents, but someone even before that. So you've got this idea of guilt carrying down through the generations and guilt by a sort of collective guilt because you belong to a group of people rather than you being responsible for your own behavior uh, and appropriately treated. That is like, I mean, I think that is one of the injustice that I cannot deal with till this day is that how did I have any saying when my great, great grandfather did something? I, I wish I could choose my ancestors, but you cannot. And it's so appalling right now in the West, there's so much white I mean, guilt, why shame, right? Because maybe your ancestors perhaps on the slaves and therefore you are guilty, you are privileged. No, like nobody has saying in it. And that's the thing in North Korea, depending on what my ancestors did, if they were the landowners, they say your blood is tainted, you know? And like, I could not choose it because of that the next generation always punished. And not only this, this is thing called guilt by association. By associating somebody, you are guilty. Not just through the blood even, just being a colleague is enough sometimes. So because I spoke out after my escape, that guilt by association, that killed my three generations of my family who are left got punished. I don't know if they all got executed or sent to prison camp. And this kind of guilt, collective guilt is what controlling the society. And I think just seeing the similarity here in free world right now is heartbreaking. And I don't know what, I don't think people understand what they're doing, but yeah. th what they're doing is so, so unbelievably dangerous. And they are playing with a fire right now. Yeah, I, that's a really powerful point. And thank you for making it. If I can put it this way, you've paid a horrendous price in your life uh, to offer us gold in terms of wisdom. And I think this is a really interesting point because you're seeing now this massive attempt uh, in, a, in the West to convince young people particularly that they are inheritors of ba a bad culture. They are bad people, particularly if they're, uh, you know, of, of a certain skin colour and even, even sexual uh, uh, gender. Um, uh, and therefore are illegitimate. They belong to a culture that's not worth defending. And here's the great irony. So far as I am, and I'm quite, I mean, I, I, I cannot, I can never personally come to grips with the horrors of slavery, the idea that one human being think they have the right to treat another human being as a goods and chattel and to do with those goods and chattels as they think fit. It is utterly abhorrent to me. But so far as I'm aware, the first culture, the first political organisation, uh, the first society that decided they'd really do something about this and seek to stop it was in fact British. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they are the ones who liberate slaves for the first time. I'm not aware of anybody else doing it. And ever since then, here's a rub. I mean, there were 70,000 members of the, of the Royal Navy, uh, and overwhelmingly they would have been white men, died enforcing the end of slavery uh, and the slave trade out of Africa. 70,000. Uh, were they racist too, simply because they were white and male? We, so thank you. We can talk a bit more about that in a moment. There's something else I want to talk about. Um, it's you, you say in the book that um, 
It's not a place where you can love. To come to the West and to explore notions of, of love in many forms, you know, it can be, I love that place, I love going to those uh, shows, you know, I love such and such a type of flower, I love my children, I love it, different forms of love, but you couldn't in North Korea except when it came to uh, uh, loving the head of state. He was the only person you were allowed to love. Yeah, so I think that's what I think shocked a lot of Westerners is that you know, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure you read a 1984 by George Orwell. It talks about double think and also talks about double speak. Who controls the language? Who controls the thoughts? The regime eliminated a lot of concepts for North Koreans. They eliminated concepts like stress. So it's like, how can you be stressed in the socialist paradise? It doesn't make sense. So they removed the concept of stress, depression. And they also, of course, remove the concept of romantic love or any human in between love or freedom, liberty, human rights. None of those concepts exist in North Korea. And therefore, my, I never heard from my mother that she loved me. Never seen my parents saying that each other they were loving each other. Only time that we all a lot use love in our sentences or in the written form when we describe our feeling towards the kings. And yet a reading of your book reveals that for all of that attempt to, if you like, destroy relationships mm -hmm. so as to increase control over people, the reality is that you had a deep love for your mother, uh, you had a love for your sister for whom you were separated for a long time, for your father who died tragically. Um, the, even the most repressive regimes in the end can't destroy completely the human desire to be in relationship. And perhaps that's the central, most serious flaw of communism in a theoretical sense. It assumes that you'll give your loyalty to the party ahead of to your loved ones uh, and uh, even your community and your country. You're expected to give your loyalty to the party and the loyalty will be rewarded in theory with them deciding what's right and what's wrong, what you can and can't do, what you can and do can't say. You actually went so far as to say that your mother advised you, you know, don't say anything because even the grass and the birds can hear you. Yeah, I mean, the thing, the first thing that she told me as a young girl was, don't even whisper because the birds and mice could hear you. And she also told me that the most dangerous thing that I had in my body was my tongue. If I say a wrong thing, it's not just going to kill me only. It was going to get up to three to eight generations of our family was going to get killed. So saying a one wrong thing gets your entire family line wiped out from this earth. That is a consequence of not having freedom of speech. And this is what really shocks me right now in, in this culture that where it's like people say, oh, we, in order to have a safe space, we have to ban hate speech. But who decides what is hate? Yeah. Usually government. But usually government, if you give them too much power, any absolute power gonna corrupt. So when we have to speak out against them, when they say that is hate speech, you cannot speak them, we are lost. And this is why also I'm saying, I sometimes I have good intentions of saying, we don't want a racist remark, so let's ban them. It's a hate speech. But then they don't know what they're playing with again. It goes down to that, like you literally kill all your family members because you said something wrong by mistake. And it almost forced North Korean to not to think anymore. Because thinking wasn't helpful to us. And even if subconscious, it was better off for us to be brainwashed than not. And I think that's the only extreme, I mean, this is like the only country who went that extreme to controlling people's minds through fear Oz Guinness, uh, who writes extensively uh, uh, in America, although he's uh, English, says that uh, our fundamental freedoms uh, of conscience and belief, of speech, of association, and there's not a hierarchy, they go together. And if you start to kill any of them, you end up killing the wellspring of Western freedom. And you have to be able to talk about these things, sometimes robustly. And we all have to be accepting sometimes of some pain in terms of hurt feelings. I w this is me, not, not us saying that. Because you've seen the price of being denied the right to speak out 
it's unspeakably cruel. And one of the things that comes through clearly in your book is the desensitization to suffering. Uh, and you describe how you yourself saw starving children on the train when your dad was taking you back to your home city uh, and found it hard to feel for them. Nobody else seemed to. The horrors uh, of going to a hospital uh, where, in fact, you woke up on the operating table because they weren't able to anaesthetize you properly, so scarcely supplied, uh, were they, with medical necessities, uh, and of indeed seeing human bodies piled up in the courtyard when you made the trek to uh, the bathrooms uh, and you were told, oh, no, they won't be taken away until there's at least seven. And you comment that it was unbelievably horrible because there were rats there in a hospital ground. Yeah. Uh, and the first thing they did was to eat out the dead people's eyes because that's the softest uh, a bit that the rats enjoy most. So this terrible desensitisation that sets in once you give rise to the idea, I suppose, that hatred's all right, that you don't have to respect another person's dignity, that you're not obliged uh, to recognise uh, another person's intrinsic value as a human being. Yeah, I think that's another thing is that I did not know the word compassion. It wasn't something in our dictionary. So empathy, sympathy, compassion wasn't something that I heard of. So when you don't have the word, you don't know the concept. And... And also the thing is when you're born, if when you're born here, right, you for you is like freedom is something like what you have. But for us, when I was born there, sitting seeing the dead bodies on the street every single day, seeing my family members dying from starvation, and nobody told me that was unusual. Nobody told me that was, you know, not okay. And I just thought that was the way of life and that is the sad thing about being a human is that we get adjust to anything. We get used to anything. And I think that's what it is. Like North Koreans gotten so used to this oppression. They don't even know that they're oppressed. But I think it's like the, another thing is people keep telling me. So if you, they say, oh, ha happiness is a relative thing. So therefore, in North Korea, everybody's starving. Everybody's hurt, in pain. Therefore, you should not be unhappy because... You have no one to compare for, but that is not thing. Like if you really don't have basic needs, you are still suffering. <laughs> you are suffering, but you just don't know what that why you're suffering. So I literally I was like making this like description. I remember when I was in North Korea, I felt like an entire my brain cells were dead. There's nothing connecting my brain. After my escape, going to South Korea, studying reading books. I just almost felt the sensations in my brain of these dots being connected, lights coming up. And like that's the thing, like your soul is dead when you're in that country. You're just numb. That is like, for me, the biggest struggle that I had to overcome was feeling something. Like I was so numb and I was dying to feeling something. And I think that sensation came back so later when I had my own son. Like. Then I was started feeling things so much and I was so grateful that the fact that I feel pain, the fact that I feel hurt, it is a it's part of being a human, like a human experience. But in North Korea, even that is being denied. The part of being feeling something, that part is being denied in this dictatorship. And that's like the kind of horror that we are talking about. And, and yet you paint a picture of people being so swamped by the constant propaganda that it's incredibly hard. Even you found it hard when you escaped to the West and started to understand the true nature of the regime you'd escaped from, to believe that uh, the leader could have been such a dreadful person uh, because you thought of him as godlike. And his father, at one point you say, even like God to Christ, he was, he was you know, top dog God. Uh, and uh, it was a stunning thing to learn that, in fact, uh, he, he'd murdered getting, you know, somewhere between one and two million uh, of, of your own people. So it's yeah. very hard to shake that propaganda if that's all you've heard. So if that's like the North Koreans are masters at double think, you can have two parallel confronting like thoughts at the same time. Like you, I remember the one of the songs that we had to sing at children's called the something called nothing to envy. 
which is saying like we have nothing to envy in this world. We live in a socialist paradise. Everything is wonderful. However, you are literally walking next to dead bodies and in your hungry stomach. But you still somehow believe that you are living in the best country, that there's nothing to envy. But you also understand there's dead bodies. And that is like the human psychology that I still don't understand, but George Orwell clearly talks about it, what humans are capable of. That we can double think. We can believe something that is so contradicting, but somehow in extreme situations, humans are capable of that because we are so, humans are very flexible when they, they, when they adjust to things. I think that's like, that was my case that, that even though when after my escape to going to China, when people were saying like Kims are dictators because of them, you you were starving in the country, and I was like defending the Kims. It's like, what the heck are you talking about? Kims are great. The people working for him might be not good. Of course, it's a powerful illustration of the importance of free free speech because what you're really painting uh, is 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 the model of what happens when all alternate views are shut down and the mind atrophies. You're not challenged. Yeah. You can't think. You can't take on different perspectives because you're only fed one. Uh, to what extent do you think people um, – do, do people talk about Karl Marx and the whole concept of communism or is it just, no, 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 the, the regime is God and we will follow the God, the, you know, the, the Pong Yang uh, leadership because that's what we do? How much sort of philosophy is in it, do you think? So initially, yeah, yeah, the Kim Il Sung was a big follower of Lenin and Marx. So there was a lot of statue of Marx and Lenin in North Korea in Kim Il Sung, the first Kim time, when he passed away in 1994. And that's Kim Jong Il of uh, developing new theory, which is Zutte, like the self reliance theory. So when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, that believing the Marx and, you know, the Lenin didn't really make sense because they all collapsed. So then Kim Jong-il came up with a new idea, which is self-reliance based on Marxism and communism. However, he shaped into a thing called where them, them being God. And we have our own way of socialism. So they call themselves socialist paradise. And North Korean party is still communist party. They call them the communist party. So that Marxism and Leninism is like very heavily influenced and embedded in North Korean entire political system. Even until the like 90s, that was like the main thing they were following. So um, in the end, I, I, you know, it seems to me that you and your mother and sister resolved that uh, it was better to risk your very lives uh, and try and escape. Uh, family circumstances uh, all outlined in the book you've been reduced in status both economically but also in terms of those 50 groupings. Uh, you slipped down because your dad, in, in his noble attempt, I think, to feed you and provide for you, had been forced to do things that the state took a very dim view of. Um, and so you decide to escape. Tell us about that because you were to discover, in fact, uh, many, many horrors on a pathway that did eventually take you to a better life. Yeah, I think this is like where I'm very grateful that you are you want to talk about this is because this is a, something happening and we should make a change in this situation. So when North Korea say escape, we are not like Syria or no, other refugees have the cars, have the phones and look into the internet, how the map looks like. You know, we don't have any of those technology helping us to understand what the how the world works. My case, at least I was lucky, I was living in the border town. And nights I mean, if you see the border of North Korea, it is the, literally the darkest place on earth. They don't have any lights there. So I was able to see these lights coming from China side. And that's when I thought, maybe if I go where the lights were, I might find something to eat. That was my pure motivation. And for me, it's like escaping was not even a matter of decision. If I don't, I was going to die from starvation anyway. That was the last thing I could do before I died from starvation. And as you say, as soon as I crossed that frozen river, but crossing the river is not even easy. The regime who cannot even afford the electricity, they put the wire fences with the high power electricity on the border with the machine guns and the guards standing. And not that even enough, they bury landmines on the general border, not concentration camp. This is why the entire country became a concentration camp. That's how they seal their borders. Nobody can escape. 
luckily the person I was escaping was a broker who bribed the guards and then helped us to cross that frozen river. And as soon as we entered China, first thing I see was my mom being raped. And the second thing they told us that we had to be sold and as a sexual slave to Chinese people. And because of that one child, one child policy that China like adopted, they aborted a lot of girls. So right now, more than 30 million men, Chinese men, can now afford to find wives. So that's when they demand these women and as a human trafficking and slavery. So it is really shocking to me in my heart right now that all these corporations, Nike, Adidas, and American like celebrities, Hollywood corporations, talking about how unjust the slavery was in America for how many hundreds of years ago. The slavery that are happening right now because of the Chinese Communist Party, they are keeping silence. If the slavery didn't like, you know, was not a good thing in the back then, why are they tolerating? Why are they keeping silence the slavery that ha- committed by North Chinese government right now? And that's when I became a slave at the age of 13. In 2007, I was sold for less than $300 in this 21st century. And my mother was sold for $65. And we sold separately like pigs. There's, there's a bunch of issues in there, all of them ugly. And they must be hard for you to talk about. But violence against women is something that we're talking a lot about in Australia. Uh, yeah. And it's never justified. It strikes at the very heart of, of, of Western freedom, really, to imply that one human being can be abused by another in any form. But you were to see things there that were really troubling, um, and you've just touched on them. Uh, your mother was raped, but she did so out of love for you. She sacrificed herself yeah. for you, and mm-hmm. you were so at the, not even aware of what was happening, just truly horrified. You realised that far from finding freedom, you'd actually been just simply enslaved in another way. And then, of course, there's this horrendous problem that you allude to, that uh, the one-child policy resulted in young females in China being aborted or killed just after death uh, because males were more highly valued. These are horrific things. And and we ought to confront them and, uh, and search ourselves and say, How would we have stood up to this? And are we free of the ugly impulses that would see us if we were subjected to that sort of propaganda? And as you and I are saying, we're starting to see some of that propaganda in the West as though we want to bring on ourselves voluntarily what others have had forced on themselves. Are we really thinking this through? Sometimes we need to be confronted with some ugly reality and ask ourselves very hard questions. Am I free of these sorts of prejudices and dreadful impulses? I think that's... uh... It is so sad right now, like America is obsessed. I mean, I'm in the USA and even like Western democrat, like democratic countries are obsessed with hating white men. And like literally, you know, I, I went to Columbia University. Basically, everything comes down to how white men, you know, screw Africa, screw the rest of the world, how they colonize the whole thing. And they, they made everything worse for everybody else. And they are guilty of every single crime that exists in this human history. And the fact that Mao killed like 50 million human beings, Stalin killed that many human beings is not taught, not even discussed. And right now, at this very moment, when these people are talking about the reparation of slaves that happened many, many, many decades ago, that their slavery exactly happening at this very moment that we are talking about, that right now there are 300,000 North Korean defectors hiding in China. Most of them are women and they are all being sold in the brothels. They're they're getting killed. They're being raped every single second. But who, what corporation, which is celebrity who is like cares about justice is standing up? Nobody. Hollywood is begging to please China no matter what cost. I get censored on YouTube when I talk about the women, North Korean women suffering on Twitter and YouTube. They censor me. And if the Me Too mattered in the West, why talking about Me Too in the under communist like, rules is, is not something they support? So this is hypocrisy that we are in. It's like, so sickening and I don't even know how, why the West is tolerating this behavior. 
This is like madness. Um, you, in fact, were traded many times as a human being, you and your mother, uh, into some dreadful situations. Staggeringly, you all managed, or you and your mother in particular, managed to find, stay in contact. You even managed to find your father and arrange for him to, to be brought over, but he was very, very ill and died. That, uh, it, 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 it must have been soul destroying and and at times would you actually describe how at one point you determined that you were going to end it all and you found a freedom in that but then resolved that no you'd fight on for your mother's sake uh, and i assume your sister and father as well at that time so you went through a great deal of pain at the hand of a man who was himself deeply conflicted plainly in some ways he was capable of feeling and he felt for you in other ways his circumstances, I uh, suppose you could say, he was locked into a regime in his own mind and behaviour of brutality and inhumanity. And so there's this terrible tussle going on in, in him between his better nature. He even looked after your father's grave, I understand, when he finally died and was buried, uh, and the brutal way that he abused you. I know. I think that's why life is so complicated. It's like nobody's pure evil, nobody's pure anger, right? And when people decide to divide things into black and white, that's like when I can see that's when we make the mistake. Nothing is that simple. And like, of course, that's what I learned in my journey. But about like what I think about what I went through is that now I remember when I went to New York, people, my editors were telling me like, oh, you, you got to get a, get a therapy. And I never heard such a thing therapy in my life. And it's like, oh, people in, in the West, they, when they have problems, they get PTSD and they go therapy. And of course, I asked, like, how much is it? It's like $200 per hour. And I was literally thinking, the fact that you know what trauma is, you don't need a therapy. And I am, the, my people in North Korea do not even know what therapy, I mean, <laughs> what like trauma is, right? They don't even know what injustice is. And now, after I'm going through all of that, gonna be resentful what I went through. Makes no sense why I survived. And that is Alice's perspective. That's what I learned about all this. And you always can come up with your own, own interpretation what happened and your own conclusion and how you respond to it. And I am, that's why I don't know if you read, I mean, you read my book that I begin with my book say there are two things I'm grateful for. One was I was born in North Korea and two was I escaped. If I didn't go yeah. in North Korea, I would not know so many things that I know now. And in a way, the things that I saw were almost keeping me sane in the West that I'm not like bitter and resentful about, you know? Like if people like, I cannot believe in the West are so, this young men are so bitter and resentful. They think they are the most like a systemically oppressed generation. And <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what to say to them at that point. No. And it's just so important that we understand how fortunate we are and how important it is that we understand the basis of freedom and we, def we go to defending it instead of attacking it all the time. But now, to move on, you, you resolve that China isn't going to work. Uh, you go through many terrible experiences. I think greatly to your credit, you opt to work in a, in a chat room, which can't have been much fun, but it was better than prostitution. And um, uh, you then identify a pathway out through Mongolia, uh, a circuitous yeah. route to escape to South Korea. Uh, and you discover, uh, and you write quite powerfully about it, uh, Christian missionaries who are prepared to literally risk their lives to help people they don't know. Again, a bittersweet thing. You, uh, North Korea, an atheistic regime, you'd never sort of heard of the concept of God or have, uh, had Christian faith outlined to you. You met these people. Tell us a bit about how that all unfolded for you. Yeah, so my thing about the, my encounters with the Christians have evolved a lot. So when I actually met them, uh, their price for us to be rescued by them was us becoming Christians. And I thought it was really funny that in North Korea, for me to survive, I had to believe in Kim's at Scots. But in China, for me to be rescued, I had to believe in God's again. And the, also another irony is that I don't know if you knew that Kim Jong Kim Il Sung, the first Kim's mother and father, their grandparents were Christians. So Kim really? Il Sung, knew, yes, they were very devout, like Christians. The so North Korean regime copied the Bible. 
they said, oh, I love I love you so much. This universe chose me as a god. So I'm giving you my son. So my son dies, however, but his spirit is with us forever. That when we die, we join them in a paradise. So that's the thing. Like People say well, why they believe kings are gods, but then same theory. Why did the people believe that Jesus was the son of gods? The same thing. If you can believe that Jesus was the son of gods, you also believe that kings are gods with that like information restriction. And because of that reason, North Korea is number one Christian persecution country. That this is like religion directly reveres what they have done, which was they were copying the whole thing. And when I met this Christian, it was like I, I was like, what is God? What is Jesus? And then my I still remember my fellow defector told me, Darling Jun, don't worry. Put the God into Kim Il Sung and put the Jesus to Kim Jong il And so you plug them in, everything makes perfect sense. Right? They can they know how much hair in your head. They know what you're thinking. That's why after my escape, I still believe that Kim Jong were able to read my thoughts. I was even afraid to think. And that's how they did. And then and then the only thing these Christians were told me that I was a sinner. And I think that's what it really gave me a lot of trauma at that time. That it was the first time I realized what I have done wasn't a good thing. I should have just killed myself. I should not have survived. But obviously, I think they were more talking about sinner perspective that all of us are sinner. But, you know, for someone going through all of that, you keep telling them you're a sinner, you cannot, like, repent it. It's a very hard thing, right? There's no path out. And so I became really not resentful of that whole experience. But now I'm thinking about it. They were the only people actually risk life for the right thing to do, right? All these people talking about inclusiveness and talking about embracing people like blah blah none of them taking actual real action to do anything and helping others and they were the people even though they demanded me to become christian and like more applying this strict christianity rules but they were still the people the most selfless people who saved another human beings and that's why you know it's so complex that's why there's no pure anger either right Everybody is imperfect. Even though they are monsters or they are good people, they all have imperfection. And that's like, it's up to us to make a reconciliation with those parts and always choose a good, what they could have offered us. So by this time, you have learnt an unbelievable amount in what we'd call in Australia, the university of life. But you turned out to be very good at um, uh, academic university as well. You get to... uh, uh, South Korea, uh, which interestingly enough, there's another interesting contrast here because uh, uh, North Korea is atheistic and Christians are dreadfully persecuted. South Korea is one of the most, uh, has one of the most sort of high concentrations of Christians relative to its population and missionaries of any country in the world. It's been enormously shaped culturally uh, since uh, the uh, Korean War. Uh, by that faith. And uh, so in many ways you get there and it's a complete and utter contrast, great gleaming halls and light and food and a very high standard of living and all of the modern uh, accoutrements of life, uh, including, of course, um, uh, the electronic uh, wizardry that lets us do the sort of things we're doing right now. Just extraordinary. We can communicate across the world, unlike North Korea, where you're lucky to be able to whisper to your neighbour. Um but it must have been an extraordinary thing to get your way through the uh, the camp where they tried to work out that you were who you said you were. You weren't a spy or somebody mm-hmm. implanted. You get through that terrible process and you're resolved. You're determined to get yourself educated. And, in fact, you do very well. But it, but it must have been incredibly hard because walking out of the difficulties, if I can put it this way, the darkness that you'd experience into the glaring light of something that's so different, it must have been personally very challenging again for you. It's, I mean, like, I think, I mean, we were, like, so poor, like, in South Korea. My mom and I would go, like, trash bins, and, like, we were just amazed. Like, why are these people throwing such a good stuff, right? Like, they throw the perfectly fine clothes, perfectly fine like mattresses, furniture and plates. We were picking them up and that wasn't actually a challenging part. Being poor was not. 
But I think the actual challenging part for me was how to trust again. When I got there, they told me everything that you believe in North Korea was lie. That Kims are not gods. They they go to bathroom. <laughs> they even like you know, they are like actual human beings pretend to be gods. And they say that Korea was started by North Korea. Americans are not bastards. I mean, South Korea is a free country, not colonized by America. And I was thinking, so if you tell me everything that I believe was a lie, how do I know what you are saying is not a lie? That is a really such a, I think, difficult spot to be in. Like I completely lost my faith in humanity and completely. I think that's when I. Yeah, and also, I mean, especially men. Like when I was thirteen, I like first my introduction to men was seeing my mom raped, and afterwards myself going through all of it. And it is when you are traumatized, you cannot think full picture. Like one thing can definitely trigger you to think and bring back the emotions. And I think a lot of that was definitely there when I got there. And how to trust men and women, everybody was so hard. And also, how can you not be resentful? As I say, one day I was watching this TV. This very famous, like celebrities in South Korea, K-pop stars are crying and it's fundraising concert. I literally thought something was horribly wrong, right? Someone dying or something going on. And they were like dedicating two hours of this concert to raising money for like animals. I love animals. But then I was thinking, if you guys have this much resources to fight for animals, right, why are you not fighting for human rights? Like how, why human rights always comes next to everything else? Humans became anti-human. That's when I became like so shocked in the West. There's so much anti-human sentiment. They're so easy to like dehumanize each other. Like I was like, if the human rights doesn't matter to you, people ask me, why do I need to care about human rights? And I'm like, if it doesn't matter to you, then who, who is gonna fight for us when we are not free, right? And this is a something of culture, I don't know where it's coming from. There's so much anti-human sentiment. And in South Korea, of course I was bitter. Like this is like, these humans are horrible. Of course they are willing to die, I mean, and cry for puppy and some animals, but they definitely don't wanna do this for the young girls being sold and raped and why they have power to change that. But to me also, when I realized, I was like, these people just did not know. And that's why I determined to risk my life to let them know what's going on. Once they know and they don't take an action, they are responsible. I do think they are guilty. Yeah. But I cannot blame the people who didn't do anything when they did not know what was going on. So at least I'm gonna do my part is letting them know what's happening and let them decide what they're going to do with that. So, so tell us about your journey back to sanity, if I can put it that way, and finding a balanced perspective in all in the midst of this because, you know, you're a person now who we would say is integrated as opposed to flying apart. You know, you've pulled it together. I'm not, I, I, you know, as much as you're willing to talk about it, I'd be interested to hear about that journey and how you see things now. Well, I think in order to be happy in life, you got to be grateful. And for me, the first thing I had to do is how to be not bitter and how not do the self-pity. That if you get into self-pity cycle, you can never get out of it. So first thing I was looking, how lucky am I? How can I be? I was always thinking, I'm so ridiculously lucky. The people who didn't make it, not because they fall less harder than me or like who was less smarter or anything. Pure chance of luck, I made it. And so many people who fall harder than me died and never made it to freedom. So realizing that truth really set me free from every resentment, bitterness. I became so grateful. And it was a very humbling thing. And also gratitude for the people who fall for democracy in South Korea, in America, right? South Koreans had dictators. They had like colonization, right? They went through so much fall for their freedom. So by the time when I came out of North Korea, there was a country like democratic for me to go to. And what scares me is that when North Korea becomes free, none of the rest of the world is free and no, they have nowhere to go, right? I think that was also <laughs> very helpful. And last, I mean, of course, for me to finding all this perspective was through reading books. 
the books really helped me to guide me through every process. You mentioned, you know, the terrible experiences you'd had at the hands of men. Not all bad because you loved your dad very dearly and you saw some humanity in the man who first bought you, some humanity there. You saw the bravery of the Han Chinese man missionary prepared to risk his life and indeed he did end up, I think, uh, in prison, didn't he? He was captured for what he was doing. Um, So you've seen both sides. Freedom in the end can only flourish when human beings trust one another. Whenever two or three are gathered, the issue of trust, can I trust this person, um, becomes comes to the fore. If you can trust them, you can flourish and go forward together. If you can't, you're naturally wary. You look for safety rather than freedom. Would you say you've got to the point where you are able to genuinely trust others? That's a, I know that's a personal question, but it, it's one asked... Uh, uh, because I think it's such an important issue, learning to trust again. It is. Well, I think I think you have such a good point there. Is that when I came to America, I couldn't believe how trusting people were. The fact that you get into Uber, how do you know that driver is not a kidnapper? Well, not like, and then also when you get a pizza, right? You order a person. How do you not know they didn't put a poison or they're gonna give you the food? And because you pay them first on the credit card. And you trust that pizza gonna get delivered. Western democracy countries operate based on trust. This is a foundation of being in free world, while having a trust. The first thing the regime did in North Korea was destroying the trust between people. So they literally even have them saying, do not even trust your own back. Of course, not to even your family members. They make spies. <laughs> so if you and I and somebody else in the room I'm spying on you, somebody's spying on me. So I'm spying, I'm being spied. Even though I'm a good person, I'm not going to report on you. I know somebody reported on me, but that person has no option because that person is also being spied on by somebody. Creating that distrust was the first thing to destroy the country. And I think that's why for me now realizing, you know, I think but the thing it is, it was a tough journey that trust was hard, right? Not trusting helped me to get where I was. Not trusting those Chinese people, not trusting the regime got me through a lot of horrible things. So my survivor instincts a lot of times tells me do not trust. But now I have to logically understand and I have so much goodness in people. I saw those missionaries. I saw so many kindness after my horrible, horrible journey. And now it makes sense to me that if I don't trust, that's when I lose. So I think understanding a full range of the cycle and where I was, why my tendency is not trusting and how to recognize that. Then how do I respond after it? It takes a lot of years of not a mastery, but practice and discipline. And now I'm definitely in a state way, way, way more trusting. And I love men. Like I love human. I love humanity. Could I ask you, um, having been through all of those experiences and coming from an atheistic country and then going to the West, which is becoming atheistic, but which was in many ways massively shaped by Christianity, how do you, how do you personally feel about Christian faith now, if I may ask you that? If it's too sensitive, it's not somewhere you want to go, I'll, I'd understand. But I'd just be interested after your life experiences. I mean, somebody, you know, you could say, it couldn't be a God, I've been treated so badly. You could say, on the other hand... Um, uh, we were meant for better than this. Some people behave so evilly that we've got to come to grips with the question of evil, good and evil, uh, and um, and choose good, and in that um, find faith. Right. Like so, after that, uh, Christians that saved me, I felt guilty. I wanted to give one a shot, so I did a go study. But I went to literally Bible study several months, and I didn't become a Christian. So afterwards, I was I I was like known atheist. I was like following Sam Harris. A lot of people hearing why they became atheists. And last year, I think two years ago, when I was reading Dr. Jordan Peterson's book Twelve Rules for Life, that's when I actually had started having new appreciation for religion, not just for Christianity in general. I was reading a lot of Buddhism and Christianity. The value that I see, it's not like because like I believe that there's Adam and Eve. I mean, it, it can be. The, the thing that as I'm getting older, what I know is like how literate I know. 
the fact that I know that I don't know that is a wisdom. There's so much unknown in this world that the, the arrogance that I had before was like, I'm an atheist, God is not there. That was coming from pure arrogance. Anything is possible. At this point, what I am trying to focus on is you should have morality. You should have rules, right? And it's very, I'm sending my son to church for that reason. It is important to hear what is sinful, what is not, what is good, what is bad. And we are raising this new generation where they never get to hear they are doing things wrong. Right? Saying no to your kids, almost the worst thing you can do right now as a parent in this Western culture. Like they can never do anything wrong. And that's how we raise generation of entitlement. They're so entitled that they think they deserve everything. And that's why I think religion was good that connected us. We had a shared values, right? Back then we had a God. We, we had to care about our neighbors. We had to forgive. We had to work hard. Like all those shared values were connected to humanity. We, now after losing God, people became believing everything and anything. They believe in literally, literally everything. And that's the world that I think I don't want to be in. And that's why I'm finding God and looking for God at this point of my life. Well, thank you for being so honest. Uh, and and yeah. it's a powerful reminder that those of, who have had comf- those of us who have led relatively comfortable lives should be very careful about making quick and rapid and convenient just judgments, if you like, uh, and, and not look honestly for purpose and meaning and explanation in life, uh, it seems to me anyway. Um, can I ask you a couple of other questions about, uh, as, you, as you look at the world today, there have been authoritarian regimes right down through history, and they've always been unbelievably controlling, and perhaps no one's battered it better, mastered it better than North Korea up until now because they have been able to close themselves off, and you've described how little you really knew about the outside world. Um, There are two interesting and new developments now that that I think make the world look different for totalitarian regimes. One is it must be very hard to cut your citizens off in the age of the internet uh, so they know nothing of the outside world, and presumably even uh, Pyongyang is now finding it harder than ever to keep their citizens completely isolated. On the other hand, the state now, particularly in China, has access to such unbelievable uh, technology that they don't have to rely on your neighbours or your children saying you said something inappropriate. They can monitor your lives all the time. It's 400 million closed-circuit television sets and, you know, recognition technology and so forth and points systems. If you do the wrong thing, you lose points and those points will determine everything from the speed of your internet to through to whether you're allowed to marry and whether you get a job. Um, so do you have any comments on the role of technology because it seems to me on the one hand it should be making it harder for authoritarian yeah. regimes to hide the truth about what they're doing to their people. On the other hand, that same technology seems to be evolving in a way that enables even more control by authoritarian regimes. And the question at heart is, do you think a place like North Korea will be eventually forced to open up? So, yeah, that's really good questions. Uh, I think about technology, the role of technology, is it going to help us be freer or like it's going to make us more oppressed and controlled by the authoritarian regimes? To me, is whatever it is, like even guns or even technology, it's a very neutral thing. You can use a gun to kill a dictator and free the enslaved people. And technology too, you can give you the access to the children to be educated and connect and have a business and create a prosperity. To me, the question is never like questioning what technology can be. Technology can shape in a way to who the users are and how they use it. And the problem that I see right now is the Chinese Communist Party. They are using this like very neutral technology into surveilling people. As you said, the social credit system, right? If your credit is low, that you cannot even buy a mere train ticket or airplane ticket to see your family members. And North Korea, with that kind of poor economy, they bought this AI, the recognition cameras, and putting in the towns. It's 1984. So they make sure that no stranger in that town coming in. They're making sure who's out, who's not in there. So it became a lot easier to surveillance people. It is for true, but then I don't think that's like what technology is responsible for. 
the people who is using it is responsible, and we need to try to change those people who are using this technology in that way. And another thing is, will North Korea ever be free? I hope so. That's why I'm doing it. But the thing is, we know that free market is not, does not bring political freedom. We saw with China, the economy grew, people got richer, people fed, and they don't have to think about the meaning. Now they can think about art and music, the meaning of life, but they are, as long as there is a fear, most of people are scared. They have now something to lose. That's why they don't want to fight. The countries like Iran and Cuba, right? Those people have more access to information than North Koreans do. They have like American newspapers on their USB drive. They watch CNN, but those people don't rise. I think that is why we need to teach people, you got to fight for freedom. That has been lacking. This is something that has to be learned the behavior. Like you cannot expecting people to be fed and the next thing they're going to do is like fighting for political freedom. But history has shown us that's not the case. Actually, people become more scared and because they are now have things to lose. Right. When you're like literally starving and do whatever you can to be free. And I think that's why so in some ways, I mean, Southern North Korea might follow China path. They might open up economy a little bit and start to feed people. Then feed, people get comfortable and they're OK being slave and can maintain the Communist Party as long as they want to. And now it is our job for us to teach these people and tell them that we got to fight to be free. And because without fighting, freedom was never coming to us. It's never given to us. Well, you're right. Uh, we in the West need to remember that we were not always free. People, people paid unbelievable prices uh, uh, to, to, to secure freedom and then to maintain it. And now we've been seduced into walking away from it, ironically, often by the influence of, of, of Marxism, really, in its modern forms where it's all about uh, race wars and uh, uh, cultural wars than about class warfare. It just presents in a different way. The overthrow of democratic capitalism is still the objective. It is extraordinary to me that so many people have been seduced by this when the evidence all around the world uh, and, and stories as powerful as yours warn us so strongly can I ask you um, uh, on the issue of fear? Because fear is a huge, huge problem for humanity. So much that is bad is done because people are afraid. Uh, you've been yeah. very courageous. Uh, you do tell the story in your book about uh, the North Korean regime, becoming aware that it's watching you very closely because of what you've said and done. Uh, are you able to throw fear, the shackles of fear off? I mean, you, you know, you've been very gutsy. Uh, you must know what fear is. Uh, you've been, the real courage is overcoming it and deciding to press on anyway, I think. So it goes back to this, right? Like, it is true that I have bad days. Most of North Koreans, after they escape, in their dreams are still in North Korea. They never leave that country in their dreams. Somehow, it's, I don't know why we cannot live our country in our dreams. We are still chased. We are still, like, worrying about finding food. So after like going through these dreams and when I wake up, I sometimes literally cannot get out of bed. And I am guilty, like the survivor security is such a weird thing that the moment when I'm in like this warm mattress in the AC and like a heater, I know my people, the people that I know, my friends is not gonna have the same thing. And how do I not feel guilty? But why, where, where I am okay with the fear is that I mean, we saw how Kim Jong-un was killing his half-brother in Malaysian airport, right? He literally does not care. And recently, we saw with the Saudis, Jamal Khashoggi, the Saudi journalist, who had a huge following on social media, on Twitter. He was chopped up like lamb chops in a Saudi council in Turkey. And what was the consequences for that? Nothing. Even the U.S. didn't stand up for it. No country. Amazon, the companies, no country stood for it. Even that kind of high profile distance dies like in most inhuman way. And I think for me to understand that is like, it is going to be unjust. Even if I die, there is no accountability for games when nothing going to happen. But I think what comforts me is that, you know, I always ask why me, why did I survive? 
And right now, there are like only 207 North Korean defectors in America. During the almost 80 years, only that little people made it to this far. And I'm sure there's a reason why I made it this far. And I, I hope to believe the reason why I survived is doing this. And another thing is, I know my enemy. My enemy is a dictator who has like 25 million slaves, who has nukes to shoot America down. And if he wants to kill me, there's nothing I can do to try to avoid. So in a way, I'm like more surrender to the situation. And at the given moment, if I'm going to live another year, if he lets me live another five years, I will do whatever I find the most meaningful and most, you know, the time that was meaningfully used in my life. So I think I just have to be very logical and rational and not emotional. And <laughs> that definitely helps. Look, I, I, uh, I can only salute you. I can only say um, that you're doing a tremendous job for freedom, really at three levels, personal freedom, because you've, you've plainly charted a way through the chains, if you like, that can so bind us up that we're just locked down in fear. But you're also, I think, striking very powerful blows for freedom in your own homeland and now in the West. So... Uh, I think you said recently that freedom is so fragile and it's never going to be there if you don't fight for it, whether you're a freedom fighter of the first order. And I, I just thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you so much for hearing my story and giving me this platform to talk about freedom. <laughs> I think we are on the same boat. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases.